yeah, you understand context, mm-hmm. right? Uh, which I think is the most vital part, especially in sales, when you're trying to build relationships, you have to understand the, the context a little bit. And I think that's why when when I read an email that can be taken in a negative way, my response isn't to write a re- email back, it's to give them a phone call. Because you you want to know the context behind the feelings and the emotions and the empathy that is you know supporting that email itself. And you don't have that with text. Welcome aboard. Please take your seat and fasten your seatbelt. The Modern Travel Agent Podcast starts now. Hello, future and fellow travel agents. Welcome to the Modern Travel Agent Podcast where it's our mission to educate and empower travel agents so they can better serve their clients and grow their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Blue Diamond Resorts. We are big fans of Blue Diamond Resorts here at Modern, not only because they have amazing properties, but also because they're huge supporters of the travel agent community. I recently had the privilege of staying at the Planet Hollywood in Cancun, and I was blown away by the resort. One of the nicest gyms I've ever seen at a resort had the best burger at Guy Fieri's Burger Joint. They also had so many amenities for the kids, movie theater, trampoline park. It's a great, great resort for families. To learn more about Blue Diamond and their agent reward program, go to bdagentrewards.com. Again, that's bdagentrewards.com. In this episode, we interview Charlie Thompson, who is the regional sales manager of Norwegian Cruise Line. Charlie was born into travel, with his mom being a veteran of the cruise industry. Charlie started his travel career right out of college while working as a youth staff member on a cruise ship based in Shanghai. From there, he went on to work for a well-respected host agency, helping build a curriculum for new agents to sell travel. He's worked as a BDM with Mark Travel Corporation, overseeing 600 different agencies and their independent contractors. Charlie has a wealth of knowledge, and it was a pleasure having him on the podcast. So without further delay, this is our interview with Charlie Thompson, the regional sales manager of Norwegian Cruise Line. You know, although you're you're still a young guy, you're you're a veteran in the travel business. Um, what's you know one of your favorite lessons that you've learned along the way? Uh, you know, you have those moments in time that just freeze. I was in a car one time with my director of sales at Mark Travel. I had been on the job for six months and we walked out of an agency. We got in the car and he looked at me and pardon my foul language, but he said, shut up. (laughs) And I looked at him and he said, listen, the best salespeople in the world don't sell a product. They listen to their clients' needs. And sometimes they align with what you're doing and sometimes they don't, but they listen to their clients' needs and they help them overcome that obstacle. And that became the foundation for what I've created a career from. I, I, I'm not a rep that goes out and says, here's a 199 rate, buy my product. I'm a rep that says, how can we cultivate our relationship in a sustainable way that five years from now, when you're a multi-million dollar business, that you will look to us and say, I appreciate how you helped me get to where I am today and help me achieve my goals. Right. That's, that's the type of rep that I want to be, that I, that I believe needs to be more of the standard in not only the cruise industry, but that the travel industry as a whole is how do we cultivate relationships and build them long term. Um, so that that's kind of the, the my favorite lesson that I've learned and that helped me build a career, a long term career. And now that I've been doing this for a while um, in the industry and in, in the space. And that is that's great advice. A great lesson. I remember when we first met years ago, I think it was the uh, second annual uh, summit, Mark Travel Summit. Never met you. I think you approached approached me. and We just started talking shop and you were generally interested in my business. And we just went back and forth and you asked questions about why are you doing it this way? Have you thought about this? And you weren't, you weren't even my BDM. Um, so, you know, you're true, you're true to your word. And, and, and from there, we've developed um, a, a great relationship. So um, bravo to, to your 
um, leader to, to point you in the right direction and shape, you know, how, how you, how you operate. That's amazing. It was a cool experience. Well, a really cool experience, but you know, just talking about the experience with you, uh, I, I believe your wife was there with us. Right. And, um, you know, I was generally interested in what you guys did because in my historical experience of working with agencies and agency owners, it was, a, there was a very big disconnect between um, uh, demographics, right? They, the way they did things was so archaic in a continuously changing environment and to have somebody with such fresh, a fresh phase of fresh, fresh ideas, you know, hosting podcasts, like that was so opportunistic to me and like just motivated me that what I was doing was the right thing, you know, that there were going to be some younger people entering the space that, that had ideas that were going to grow the base. Right. So I think you, you, you kind of shown a light of saying, Hey, look, there is a huge future because there are people that are interested in the same space you are. Right. And that, that was just a really cool connect. So I, I appreciated it and I valued it. And I think that's why we're, we're still talking to this day. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. This industry is, is great for, for the relationships, right? Because there's so many great people that you can connect with and, and learn from. And, um, you know, obviously we've, we're all influenced by, you know, our peers and the people in the industry and the people around us. Your situation is, is kind of unique, though, with, with you know, your, your mom because she's in the industry, but she's also, you know, your mother. And, and so what I wanted to know is um, to what degree do you think your, your mom and the way that she ran her business and the way that she operated and her personality and then your dad, to what that shaped your views of, of business and, and sort of relationships? Yeah, so there's such a dichotomy in the relationship with my parents. My dad is the rock. I mean, he is a very reserved, conservative, um, you know, CFO for big, he was the CFO for big companies back in the day. And, you know, he, he views the world a little bit differently. You know, he, he doesn't mind relationships, but he's also very analytical and he evaluates the numbers and the, uh, really the data to make sure that the company is a viable option, right? And so taking the learnings in that respect and saying, hey, look, there are some times we have to make decisions that aren't, you know, personal. They're, they're there to make sure that our company is here so you can still sell us, right? And, you know, taking that perspective um, was very much in conflict to my mom's ability to literally walk up to anybody and have a little bit of a Napoleon complex saying, I'm going to talk to you. If you don't want to talk to me, I'm still going to talk to you. You know, I think there's learnings from that, right? And teachings from that. And she was very good at asking questions. She was very good at engaging with any, anybody, any demographic, any audience that she was speaking to. I watched her get up on stage and speak to large audiences. I've watched her just with this fearless, you know, power that, that comes from, you know, just a self-confidence that you kind of have to have in this thick skin because our role can be uh, very, very divisive. Uh, it, there's a lot of times that people contact you only because they have a problem and it can weigh on you when you can't help them solve it or when you can't help them overcome that obstacle or when you know, especially during a pandemic, when people are coming to you saying, I'm going to lose my house if I can't get the refund, I'm going to lose my car, I'm going to lose my business, we need to get refunds for my client, and, and you, you can't do anything, right? It, it, there was a time period where within a week, I had three agencies who were going to close their doors and, and really potentially lose their, lose their livelihoods, um, all reaching out to me with, do you know somebody who can get me a job? You know, do you know somebody that can help me through this? And because we've cultivated these relationships, you know, I think without having the support of my father and understanding the, the, the rock and the foundation, I wouldn't have had the strength to get through. I think I would have just been like, I'm done um, to where we are today, where we see a light at the end of the tunnel, right? And so it's been very important to have the support system of my parents and, and how I was raised and uh, where they have influenced um, the direction of, of how I want to run my business and my, my relationships to where they are today. 
You mentioned um, earlier when you when you were talking about uh, working at the host agency that uh, you were working uh, with Facebook, you know, social media at an early early time. Um, what technology or social network opportunities are you most excited about today, and why? So yeah, I was actually talking to a group of uh, tech developers and, and uh, you know, S, SEO specialists and so forth um, about this the other day. You know, we we pretty much came to the conclusion, uh, a few different conclusions. One that, you know, Facebook, we, we called it dead. Um, it's not dead. It's just negative space. And because it's negative space, it's not adding positive value to the future of travel or the industries or communications or sets, right? It became a very negative thing in 2020 because of the, the confluence of information that was derived on that site itself and how it continuously enabled um you know, there to be some just negative strings of information, right? Well, we're looking, when I look at technology, back when I started at KHM, Facebook was a very positive place. It was to connect with people that you went to high school with, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever it was. And it was a way to reconnect and show pictures of, you know, for my parents to see pictures of my kids growing up, if they're on the other side of the country, or my friends to see it if they're in a different part of the world, right? And then it just it changed over time. And I think every piece of technology does and develops. Um, but it also allowed us to have groups back when I remember the first time Facebook launched groups and we started a KHM host agency, independent contractor group platform on Facebook where all of the agents could talk to one another and say, how did you solve this problem? How did you overcome this? Do you have a recommendation for the destination? And it was like such a positive space, right? And so when I look at technology in today's world, right, Instagram has become a little bit of that positive influence. I think that's one of the primary one primary ones now, but Twitter had become has become a very divisive you know, platform, right? And I think technology does change over time to where the more influence you have on that and the more direction you have, it becomes a, a, a rainbow effect. You start to see this downturn of effectiveness because the content on those sites are, uh, b- does not become a positive influence to the people that are following. It becomes very divisive. And so the places positively, positively now are going to be podcast space because it's a controlled environment. And I look at safety. Um, being able to control the narrative, right? Safety is uh, very aligned in that space. So podcasts are huge. Instagram is that huge because Instagrammers can um, do have control over the narrative of of what they're trying to sell, of what they're trying to promote. And then the new one, um, which is still in beta, is going to be Clubhouse, which is uh, an audio platform. And the reason I love it is it's invite only. So you're responsible for the people that you invite to the club. And if they're not adding positive value, you know, not only will Clubhouse kick them off, but you have the ability to say, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not what we do here. Right. And so it's becoming a very good place to have an, a one hour audio conversation with 300 people and they all have different ideas and influences and context and contact, you know, context and contacts um, to which you can start building and uh, creating relationships that might help take your direction, take your business to the next step. They might allow collaboration effort where you're both able to monetize from the situation. Um, and they're really a great learning ground because there is so much of America, really the world, that are auditorial learners that, you know, they're not going to sit there and read paragraphs, but that's where the podcast space comes into play. And that's where Clubhouse comes into play is that people are learning by connecting and they're also learning by hearing. Um, but the safety out, uh, the safety component of creating, any, of, of owning and creating your narrative is, I think, where what I look at from a technology standpoint to say, where am I going to invest my time, right? So uh, those are a few of the ones that I think are really positive in the space. And I think that, you know, one of the cool things about Clubhouse is just due to the nature that you can hear their verbal cues. I mean, you're literally hearing their voice can help the civility of the conversation a little bit, um, as opposed to like text-based platforms like Twitter, for instance, which it's like, you know, you read any tweet, the person on the other end could be perfectly happy or great. You can read it in the worst way possible, right? It's like, you know, and we all do that with emails too. You read an email like the most negative way possible. Then you talk to them over the phone and they're totally fine. You know, so that's kind of a cool thing about Clubhouse, right? Is is you get to hear somebody's voice and and their tone and 
Yeah, you understand context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is the most vital part, especially in sales. When you're trying to build relationships, you have to understand the, the context a little bit. And I think that's why when, when I read an email that's a that, that, that can be taken in a negative way, I'm, my response isn't to write an email back. It's to give them a phone call. And because it, you, you want to know the context behind the feelings and the emotions and the empathy that is you know, supporting that email itself. And you don't have that with text. And so, the, yeah, you're right. Oh, spot on with Clubhouse. That, that is one of the huge components that I love about that space and that platform. I was going to ask too, this is, um, I was on uh, Twitter, I don't know, a couple of nights ago and, you know, they recently added the stories feature kind of at the top to copy Instagram a little bit. I don't think people are using it that much, but they have it on there. They had a feature that was like, I don't know what they called it, but it was almost like clubhouse. It was, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson was in a room talking on stage in front of all these people listening in. So that's also an interesting thing too, is like as Clubhouse sort of breaks its way in to acceptance, it'll be interesting to see if the other platforms try to do that the same way that Instagram took the stories from Snapchat and there's sort of that consolidation as well. What, what's that statement? Something about uh, like when somebody copies what you, do, what you do, it's the highest form of flattery, right? <laughs> yeah, so they do something right. Right. And you got to remember, you know, when it comes to any tech platform, with the exception of Google, the exception of Google, the, um, the aptitude for them to remain viable is important for the future of their organization, which is why you see companies like Facebook buying off the competition. You know, we see it in every business set, but you're going to start to see um, Facebook fighting for that space, right? And, and Twitter, I, I don't know how the subsidiary works or if they're connected or how they're connected um, Instagram or what they own uh, behind the scenes. It's not my space, but, you know, that's, you know, they're going to start doing those things because competition in the tech world changes so rapidly. And with large companies, including cruise lines, you know, typically they're investing money that they believe they're going to have, like, if that makes sense. Like they believe the money flows coming in because of the volume of people on the platform. So they've already pre-spent that money on future acquisitions or future uh, development and not exactly the best form of business personally in this new world that we're moving into where change is so consistent, but that's typically where they see a large portion of their uh, growth happening. So I, we'll see. We'll see how the future turns out. I, you know, it's not my, not my specialty, and I don't really want to make too many comments on that. But I, I think you, you you make a good point though that um, you know copying or whatever is the highest form of flattery. That, that's so true, and so you know that happens in every space, as you mentioned. Um, that's one of the great things of what we're trying to do with this podcast is to like you know highlight different uh, lessons that have been learned or different agencies or, or agent representatives or whatever that have insights that other agents can start practicing, that they can put into their business. They can put their unique spin on it. They can make it theirs, but they can, you know, learn from it. And so, you know, one of the things that, that I would ask is, what do you think the most successful travel agencies are currently doing? I'd say really good question you know the, the space has changed so much you know really good it really every really good travel agency has the ability to to build relationships period um whatever that looks like in the space that they want to operate in it is up to them in their business plans and the future and the direction of their organization but every really good one knows how to connect with their audience um, and use different platforms to do that. You know, I, I look at the dichotomy of the territory that I've covered for years, and Utah is one that still operates off of, you know, radio shows and television advertising and newspaper content, and it works for them because that's what their audience likes to see. You know, I can't sit there and criticize it when it's literally a viable opportunity in their marketplace, right? Um, whereas, you know, you hop the mountain range and you drive a little bit south and you end up in Denver, I literally do not know somebody that actually gets the newspaper. None of my neighbors, none of my friends, none of my family, you know, it, 
it's just a different world where how they're cultivating relationships are social media platforms, are events that they're hosting, are consumer events, or, or just general, you know, um, agency events or vendor events or whatever it might be. Um, they connect it in, in Colorado. There's so many connections that take place on out, outdoor patios at like breweries, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it sounds so crazy, but the, the amount of people and connections that we have made just by heading to a brewery with our dog and our two toddlers playing in the, the dirt or the sand or running around is invaluable. You know, it, it, it builds community in a different way, right? So that's what you, if you're starting out an agency or if you want to be a successful agency, it's how do you build your community? That's the question you have to answer um, first, you know, and once you have a direction, the rest of the business will be able to, you know, feather out and, and filter out. And you talk about building a, building a community, um, you know, we've also talked about collaboration in the past. What should agencies look for when thinking about collaborating inside the travel industry, possibly with, you know, whether it's an influencer or whether it's, you know, another business, um, what should they look for and what questions should they be asking themselves? Um, well, the, it, it, the first question is what, what does your business plan say? You know, what have you created as far as the direction of your organization, right? You're not going to collaborate with a wedding dress maker if you're not selling weddings. Right. So th that's the first question, figure out which direction you want to take it. You know, in, in the future of travel, is going to be based off of uh, trends uh, in the millennial and Gen, Gen Z space. And so how do you, the, the biggest obstacle over the past 10 years has really been how do um, baby boomers communicate effectively with millennial gen demographics, right? That's the biggest challenge that a lot of these advisors and agencies have had is how do they communicate, right? Because there's this disconnect, um, and there's actually a, uh, you know, there's a couple articles written, up, written about this that I've seen. But uh, do you remember the, in school, in the library, there was uh, an old green screen computer that had Oregon Trail. <laughs> yeah. And then right next to it was the Dewey Decimal System, a box that you could find library books from. Yeah, right. absolutely. You, a, you guys were part of that demographic that you walked into the library and you, were, you saw that. And they called it the Oregon Trail Generation. And it's maybe like a four or five year period. And people have done like research studies about it. But it's where for most of our elementary and middle school lives, we had to go knock on the door to go find a friend to play with. We had to make a phone call and there was no voicemail. Like, we had to be outside and engage in relationships that were uh, apart from any sort of technology platform. But we also had the high school ability or um, even college ability to incorporate technology into that relationship space. And they find the best managers for Fortune 500 companies are people that were born in that demographic because they have the ability to communicate on both ends of the spectrum, right? And so when I look at advisors, if you're going to try to communicate to the next sector of advisors, you have to figure out how to, you're going to use space that they enjoy hearing from. Like when I communicate with an advisor, the question isn't how I want to communicate with them. The question is, how do you want me to communicate with you? And asking them up front. And if they say text message is the best, guess what? My role and responsibility isn't to send them an email or to give them a phone call. My role and responsibility is to communicate in the most effective manner possible. And if they say text message, I'm texting them um, because that's going to get the most out of our relationship and that's going to benefit both parties. Um, the agencies need to be asking themselves, how are, they gonna, how are they going to bring in a younger demographic? How are they going to relate to that audience? And that's the, that's the, the solve. That's what they have to figure out how they're going to solve. You know, I, I look at spaces. We talked about some of them, Instagram and Clubhouse and podcasts. And, you know, there's some people that are doing it in really good ways. There are other people that are testing it out. And uh, I think there are some people that are afraid out of their mind, uh, you know, and operating in those, in, the, in those spaces. But either way, I think the future is an agency. You guys are part of consortia, right? Yes. Okay. So under the consortium umbrella, you have all these vendors. 
that you partner with and do business transactions with. But I think the consortium space needs to incorporate an entire category called influencers and bloggers and podcasters. And I think that it would allow all these agencies direct access to people who specialize in that space. And there'd be some sort of transactional communication or collaboration in that space to offer them services um, to help elevate their business entities, where you could, um, instead of having to do all of this manually, I think so many agents and agency owners are so good at A, being a business owner and B, selling travel that when it comes to marketing and um, growing their entity space, growing their, 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 their leads, their lead generation, you know, that becomes a tertiary on the uh, list of importance, right? Uh, whereas it's going to need to be elevated in order to be a successful top level agency um, in, in the future. But that's just a random idea. That, that, that is an intimidating space, um, sort of the, the influencer marketplace, right? It's like, you know, even people who are familiar with the space can be overwhelmed by all the different options and all the different routes that you can go that somebody who's not familiar with it. Um, yeah. yeah, you're spot on. And to be honest, bloggers and influencers have no idea that travel, what travel advisors do or how they work in that space. But they need a partnership too to monetize their situation because they've got all these thousands and millions of followers that are asking them about their travels and their adventures, but they don't have the ability to monetize on that because they don't understand what travel advisors do. Right. So I think there's a huge collaboration opportunity and potential in that space for the future of reaching millennial demographics, Gen Z, and, and bringing them especially into the cruise industry where our average, our average demographic is 55 and up. Right. So like we need to figure out how to bridge that gap. I think that's, that's cool too, the reduce friction, as you said, that, that would be a, a good option for, to do that. Um, you know, a lot of, of what you've, you've talked about today has in some sense focused on the importance of listening, right? Talking less and, and listening more and sort of paying attention to what people are doing and, you know, listening to people in the industry, listening to influencers. How do you want to be communicated with? What's the best way to contact with you? Um, you know, Obviously, that, that is just a fundamental part also being a good travel agent is listening yeah. to your customer. On your end, being that you've seen travel agencies, you've worked on the inside, you've worked on the outside, you've, you've listened to them from every possible angle. Um, what, do you, what mistakes are they making or, or where, where are they coming up short, let's say, or, or what have you learned sort of in that listening process? What are they struggling with? Um. I mean, I think transactional, you know, I think there's this historical presence about, around travel agents and travel advisors of them being a transactional service instead of being a, um, you know, providing, um, instead of being like a lawyer or an accountant where they value their service, they um, operate more like a call center where it's not service necessarily service oriented. You know, I think the biggest mistake is not focusing on the service you're providing your clients, um, but, you know, making everything out to be a transaction uh, where it's just taking money and sending them on vacation, you know, the move towards sustainability and environmental and getting to know the, the places that you're going and the people in context, you know, providing that service to saying, I'm a specialist in Hawaii. And these are things that are not going to be what you read on booking.com, you know, like that's, that's what really value you know, provides value to your client. And that's what your clients are looking for is what value you're providing. And if you don't have a relationship with your, you know, your BDM or your regional sales manager, if you don't have a relationship with, the property that you're sending your clients to or the airline that you're sending your clients on or the destination management company that you're using in destination. If you don't have those relationships, there's a huge disconnect between the value you're providing your client and just a transaction like you would have via Expedia or whatever. The other one um, is the insurance component. Man, we just went through a pandemic and how many people didn't have insurance policies to help protect them. And Yes, that is large scale. That is not the norm. But the amount of stories that I have in regards to client experiences and destination outside of a pandemic, getting stuck or having a problem, that's where the true value of a travel advisor comes into play. How do you get them out of those? 
I, you know, and if, if you're an advisor and you're not selling an insurance policy, um, you know, you're devaluing yourself and your ability to solve that client's problem when there is an issue. You know, so I, 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 they don't charge service fees, which astounds me because every lawyer and every accountant and every service entity does. You know, even when you go to the restaurant now and it says for your, on the bottom of your receipt, it says for, um, what does it say? For, they, they have this like ser- the service charges now, like, you know, for your convenience, we've added an 18% service charge continuity, <laughs> right? Like I'm like, even at, even at restaurants, they're doing it. What makes you think that you can't, you know, like that's, that's where I think if you do, you already value yourself as an entity in the space. If you don't, I understand why, because it's not historical and it's not something that everybody does. So you don't feel the need to, but I also want to encourage everybody to have some sort of service fee because your time is valuable and what you do is a very, very important job um, because nobody, there are very few people who go on vacation and say, when, when they get back, they talk about how much they spent. They all talk about the memories that they made. And that's what you have to focus on is the fact that that's what they're going to take away from the experience. So also a good filter. You know, there's that element of the the surcharge too. I mean, one, it's like you feel like you have to bring up the quality of your product to deliver on what you promise. But then on the other end, it it filters out some of the people who are just going to make you spin your wheels and they're, they're just price checking you against 10 other places. Uh, and I look at that and say, is that really a client you want to keep? Right. Right. Is that, a, is that the clientele that you want in your database? People that are going to, um, you're going to spend more time on for less money. Right. If that's the client you want, but by all means, but I would say that the value you're adding, you know, isn't, isn't that clientele, that clientele can hop on united.com and book an airline ticket. You know, that's not the space that you want to be in. So how, right. how would you um, how would you tell or what advice would you give to an agent who has never charged a fee? Where do they start? Should they do hourly? Should they have a set fee based off a of number of nights? What would you recommend? <laughs> I, I don't know their business plan. You know, like you, you can't you can't be successful in this space. Period. If you don't have a business plan, and a business when I say business plan, if you don't have direction. You don't have a goal. What is your goal? What is your objection, right? Uh, objective. And, you know, when you start out, I, I don't care if it's 25 bucks for a consultation fee, you know, that guess what? You, it, you get back in your package if you book with me. Like that, that can be the simple starting point of saying, hey, look, I charge 25 bucks up front. If you make the booking with me, you, the $25 is included. Uh, as a deposit on that booking. And, you, you know, we'll take the $25 out of the, the total amount, right? And that's a great way to start. You know, I think, um, you know, some of the big companies are some of the ones that have, do this in the luxury space. I mean, they have $100 consult, consultation fees that are non-refundable um, in large part to the time and energy it takes to do uh, research for an African safari and airline tickets. And, you know, so I think it depends on your space. I think, in your space and like a wedding space, yeah, there should be a thousand dollar non-refundable. We plan your wedding fee, and you know whether you're not you, you, you they use it towards the wedding if they book the wedding with you. Um, the time and energy it takes for you and your team and your staff and the people to do the research and potentially put the bookings together and j- just what it is. I mean, the services you provide are of such quality that I feel like a thousand dollars is pretty reasonable for something that could be included in the package price if they book the wedding with you. Right. But it's also one of those things where if you, if they decide to just shop you, you know, um, against the competition or doing it themselves, right. Um, you know, it, they're paying for the value of your time, you know? And so I, that's where I look at it and say, it depends on what you're doing, right. It depends on your business plan, your model, uh, where I think the space and what you guys do is such a, an elite level in comparison to most other companies I work with that, there should be a premium to that, right? There should be something of a high standard. Um, But again, it's, it's everyone's own individual discretion on that. And it's all over the board in the industry. 
What advice would you give to someone who's looking to uh, get into the travel industry or become a travel agent? Um, there's no like. Take a deep breath. <laughs> uh, it's a roller coaster ride. And if you like change, it's a great space for you. If you're adaptable and you are relationship centric, um, you like to evaluate data, quantitative and qualitative data, then this is a great opportunity for you. Um, if you're a transaction person or you, you know, you like technology, um, you know, I think, the travel space as a whole is a little behind on a uh, little of that, um, you know, the, especially the future of this, of, of how they're going to operate. But yeah, I think uh, biggest advice is definitely take a deep breath, understand that it's a roller coaster and that for every three ups you have, there will be a down, you know, and, and it's how you can overcome those challenges that make you successful in the space. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I remember, you know, every still get a little anxious every hurricane season, you know, thinking, OK, you know, we have people traveling and then and everything that happened with tainted alcohol. And then, uh, you know, the this, this stuff that happened uh, in the Dominican Republic with the negative press. And then 2020 said, here, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. there, there's uh, there's been nothing quite like, you know, this what we dealt with so i mean what would you say what what's your biggest takeaway from uh from 2020 oh you know who your friends are for sure you know um a lot of people talk a big game a lot of people that um you know say they're your friend but when it when push comes to shove when it whether it's a client in the agency space or whether it's a, a company that you deal with on a consistent basis or whether it's um, an entity on the other side of the world. You know, I look at Barbados as being the example of what it means to have a relationship. You know, if it wasn't for Barbados and the space from, and their, their government and the relationships that they have with the cruise lines that go there, getting our crew, um, you know, getting crew from, from ships um, home would have been a nearly near impossible task. And so, you know, I know Royal's done a great job of like even hoarding out of Barbados now as a thank you for that relationship, right? So who are your friends, right? Who, who are the people that are going to be there through the tough times as well as the good times? I think DMC space, uh, destination management companies that, you know, we're like, okay, how do we get your clients taken care of? Or how do we provide transportation to your staff or your team? So, um, you know, to, to get them where they need to be, to get them home, to be with their families in a time of need, right? And, and th 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 those are invaluable in the future, I think. Uh, the, also, how do you operate in a space? The biggest learning is how do I operate in a space that isn't a handshake? Seeing somebody in, in, in person, you know, it's, it's been a challenge. I think I've gone, you know, a big portion of my market is still, um, I'm going to call it old school, but I don't view it that way necessarily. But on the telephone, picking up the phone and calling somebody has become an invaluable commodity because you can hear their voice. And you can understand the depth behind the situation. Uh, and we have become so afraid of those we talked about earlier of those text messages or those emails and not understanding the context that we have become re reliant upon making phone calls again and and just making sure that the tone of their voice is in, in a good space to to grow and evaluate the business uh, together you know? so uh, those are some huge takeaways that i've learned oh my goodness sorry that's okay <laughs> I mean, that's a good time for the phone to ring. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Very true. All right, Charlie. So um, 
you just hit the Powerball lotto. So money and time, it's not an issue. Where are you going? What does your itinerary look like? What are you planning on doing? I could go down the route of saying, okay, I would just love to do Inner Island, Hawaii, because I, it's my home away from home. Uh, I have been very fortunate and traveled to a lot of the places that I wanted to go. So when it comes to like people's bucket lists and having all of these destinations and all these opportunities around the world and going to visit places, I, I like my two-year-old, my four-year-old, and you know, part of me says I won the lotto. I'm going to stay at home and hang out with them and watch them grow and go to soccer games and um, do that because I spent so much of my life being able to have access to traveling. But I think for the podcast question, you know, I'd love to take my kids over to Hawaii. Um, it, I call it my home away from home. If my wife ever wasn't able to get a hold of me, she'd know where I was. If that makes any sense, you know, I, there is this sense of community that makes you feel like you belong the minute you step foot on any Hawaiian island. This gratitude of empathy and, and emotion and, and support from everyone there. And this real desire to enhance your experience. And it's one of the few destinations that really encompasses all of that, that I've been to. Um, whether it's uh, Asian or Samoan heritage or um, just what Hawaii has built as a community, it just is elevated so high in my standard of travel um, to where it, there's really very few places on earth that compare. And so that's, that's where I would go. And the reason I do the inner Island is I've got a family and I, you know, it becomes expensive if I just wanted to stay there for two weeks or three weeks. So being able to cover food costs and drink costs and beverage costs and, you know, taking a two-year-old and a four-year-old and having a daycare facility, you know, built in and um, really engagement for kids on board the ships just enables a, a wholehearted experience and a family experience um, at a little bit different level. So that's, that's probably what I would do. Yeah. There is something just so special about Hawaii, just that aloha spirit that you really don't understand in, in, until you go and, and you actually experience it. Um, my wife and I honeymooned there Maui and Kauai for 10 days. And it was just such an amazing, such an amazing experience. Yeah. The Ohana extends further than the Hawaiian islands. Like when you show up family, it, you know, family is family. family oh, you're, you're always Ohana, right? So like, I love the fact that they treat you like family. Uh, absolutely. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for, for chatting with us today, sharing your insight. It's been a pleasure and uh, looking forward to just continuously growing, growing our relationship in the future. Yeah. I'm excited about the future. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time.